second phase in the clinical trial. So there are something like 160 coronavirus vaccines that are currently in some phase of the clinical trial, whether it's phase one, which is safety, phase two, which is efficacy. Um, and the question is, what are they? What kinds of vaccines are being put forward? And so I just asked you to name one, tell me what kind of group is that in? What are the advantages of, the, of that approach? Um, and what are the disadvantages? So I'm not gonna go through all of them, but there's a nice article in Nature that you can go and look at about all of the different versions. And they really fall down into the different groups that we talked about. Okay, so there are uh, either killed or weakened virus, meaning attenuated virus. So there are uh, at least seven of those. There's only two that are, are weakened or attenuated virus because it's much more difficult to do. It's much easier to just kill it than it is to, to make it replicate uh, weaker. So those ones are tend to be at, at early stages of production. Oh, sorry. Let me share the screen. <coughs> there, that's better. So there are um, those, the, vir the ones that are relying on weakened virus tend to be very early stages because it takes a long time to develop those. Other approaches are much farther ahead, even though they may not work as well because it's much easier to do. So Moderna's RNA-based va vaccine, it falls under this nucleic acid group, okay? The blue group. So it's an RNA-based vaccine. They're just injecting the RNA and hoping they get expression of viral proteins and they make an immune response to it. And then there are others where you're just injecting either viruses or virus-like particles, or sorry, protein subunits or virus-like particles. It's harder to make virus-like particles, so fewer approaches do that, but many more will just take the protein subunits. There's a number of other approaches, and I, I included them here or, or mentioned them here because some of them are passive immunization. They're transferring uh, convalescent serum to uh, SARS-CoV-2 patients. And so that there are other approaches that we've talked about that are immunization, but they're, they're passive immunization rather than the active vaccine. Now, if we go back to which approaches are, how, what are the benefits, right? Of the benefits of having a virus, particularly the weakened virus, is that it's very much similar to the real thing that you're trying to protect against. And so you're much more likely to have a protective immune response. If you have a viral vector, it's still a virus. And so you're still likely to be close to the kind of response you would need for coronavirus. But if you have something that's inactivated, meaning killed, or it's a protein subunit or virus-like particle, those aren't replicating, they're just basically, you know, the shell of something. And so they have a very different lifestyle. Should be pretty obvious that you also, for nucleic acids, also have a very different sort of lifestyle compared to the wild type virus. And so there's no guarantee that those kinds of things are going to give you a protective immune response. On the other hand, if the ones that are underlined right now, those are the five easiest things to do. Kill it, express some of the subunits, or just put in the genetic material for it. You can do that in a matter of a couple of days. So it's a very fast way to go ahead. Okay, so today we're gonna to sort of move up the scale. We first started talking about vaccination, which is really just trying to get an immune response against something you, you do. It's a wanted immune response against something foreign. But then when we start talking about actual infections, it's important to sort of phrase these in terms of, of what the immune system is doing and then how do pathogens respond to that. And for those of you who are in the virology course, this semester is gonna be very similar to the lecture I gave there on last week on Thursday. But this is sort of the idea of how do you make an immune response to viruses? And I limited this to viruses rather than to all pathogens because it gets kind of messy to start saying, well, I need to, you're gonna have a different kind of response to a bacteria or a helminth. But in general, if you don't clear bacteria or a fungi, 
you're going to die from it. Okay, so it's, it's really like you go into sepsis and it, there's no other option. Well, viruses are much sneakier than that. They can persist for long times and, and you, they have strategies to shut down your immune system. So that's what we're going to cover today. So to understand viruses, it's important to, to understand where they were first identified. And it may surprise you that the first uh, viruses were identified in 1857. And this really came out of uh, the tobacco growers uh, started noticing that they had this sort of mosaic disease in their crops. And you can see that on the left there, they either the, the uh, leaves start turning different colors of green and then they start turning brown. Now this was a huge problem because at that time tobacco was a huge money maker and it made the tobacco bitter, extremely bitter. And so the, the, those weren't any good. And so this became a, a national emergency in the Netherlands. And around this time, where eventually um, the idea was they couldn't figure out what was the causative agent because they couldn't, they couldn't culture any bacteria from this. And so what happened is that the, the Pasteur Chamberlain filter that was developed, and this is a porcelain based filter with pore sizes that are too small for bacteria to pass through. Okay, so they're, you know, they're very small micron size uh, pores. And if they put extracts from the tobacco mosaic diseased plants through this Chamberlain filter, and then put that what they got out on the other side onto tobacco plants, they still get mosaic disease. So it's too small to be a bacteria or a fungi. And so this was the first um, identification of a virus. And this was the functional definition of a virus for many years was just, could you filter it through this Chamberlain filter? And if you could, then that was defined as a virus. Now, this really took you know, this continued into the, into the 20th century, um, particularly in the United States. And what H.H. H. McKinney, uh, who was, was actually in the military and then in the Department of Agriculture, isolated variants of tobacco mosaic disease, uh, the agent at the time. And so these filterable agents had some genetic variants. They, were, they didn't all do exactly the same thing, but if you passage this one, or you, you filtered this one, put it on the plants, it reproduced the, the same disease it started with. But a, a, another version of that uh, mosaic disease agent that had a different phenotype, if you filtered that, it would reproduce that phenotype. And so that really said there was some genetic material in it. Now, at the time, we didn't know what genetic material meant. Most people thought it still meant proteins. So this really led to, it led to a, I think what we would call a vaccine, it was really a competitive agent that basically didn't grow very well and would outcompete, or they would set it up so it was already there in tobacco plants and so the, the uh, pathogenic version couldn't grow. It really came down to Helen Purdy Beal, who um, really took this into the immune, immuno, sorry, immunology realm. And she took these uh, extracts from, from tobacco plants that had this mosaic disease, and she immunized rabbits with it. Now, oh, of course, it's not going to replicate in rabbits, but you do make an immune response to this protein that, you, that you've injected. And so she got this, and they developed antibodies, or serum, that only reacted with diseased plants. And so the idea was that this, if you could get an antibody against it, then it must have protein. So it's like other life forms. It's just, it's very small. Okay, so this was really the first definition of a virus. It's filterable, genetic, has genetic material, and it has proteins that can elicit an immune reaction. So if we take the first criteria, how small are viruses? And I, I like this sort of example is, is showing you the scale. And so first we start with the tip of a needle. Okay, so this is a sewing needle, a very fine needle. And it, at high resolution, it doesn't look very fine. It looks kind of blunt. But if you think about the tip of a needle, if you zoom in on that, if that needle is coated with bacteria. You can see how small those bacterium are compared to the tip of the needle. 
Okay, so here's one single bacteria. If you look at the size of a very large virus, the bacteria T4 phage, you can see that it's about one one hundredth the size of an E. coli bacteria. Okay, so that's a huge virus um, sort of compared to bacteria. But viruses actually have a lot of variation in their size, right? Here's uh, the T4 phage, and that's fairly large. Some of the largest ones are smallpox. We now know about some megaviruses that are almost the size of bacteria. Those are still being sort of discovered. Um, but then you can get some very, the very smallest viruses are 10 to 20 nanometers. Okay, so they can become much smaller than this. They're, and for scale, this is one tenth the size of this. So instead of one one hundredth size of a bacteria, it's one one thousandth of the size of a bacteria. So they're very small. And that's why you can put them through the Chamberlain filter, uh, but bacteria cannot. Now, the other part of viruses is that we sort of lump them all together, but they're very different. It's a very diverse family of, or a very diverse uh, number of different species in the virus uh, group. So you can have some viruses like uh, one that we've mentioned before and has been used in this class, LCMV, which is lymphocytic choriomeningitis virus. It is a very simple virus. It's only got four genes. It's got a glycoprotein, uh, which helps it get into cells. Uh, Z, a zinc finger binding domain that assembles the virus, a nuclear protein that assembles the genetic material, and a polymerase that replicates the genetic material. Okay, so it's very simple. Other viruses get a little more complex. So adenovirus has about 38 genes, and then those are further uh, cut up into about 100 different proteins. There's only a very few structural proteins that are included in the virus particle, so it's it's actually still a very simple thing. If you consider, you know, you have about 20 to 25,000 genes, we're talking about 38 genes, and yet adenovirus is able to survive and pass around through human populations. And then some of the larger viruses, like the pox viruses, have hundreds of genes, okay, and encoding hundreds, um, even more proteins. And they can have quite complex internal structures, okay. So uh, some of the smaller viruses have very limited structure. They're basically just a sack full of it. But some of the larger viruses like, uh, like pox viruses have this brick shape. Uh, rabies virus has, uh, rhabdoviruses have a bullet shape. You know, so you can have quite complex structures. But in general, viruses are still packing light. They don't take a lot of, of proteins with them, but they, bring the genetic material so that they have the ability to code a lot of different proteins once they infect a cell. Now, having said that, I'm not gonna ask you to name different families of viruses. I'm just giving you some examples of viruses. So when we talk about the immune response to them, we can sort of parse them out of which different group do they belong in. Are they small viruses with only a few genes? Were they very large viruses that have a lot more options? Okay, so to, to be a virus, um, you have to either have a protein capsid or a plasma membrane. Okay, you have to have one of those that that's really thinking you have to have a container, whether it's the uh, a box, right, which would be a, a rigid capsid or a bag, a plastic bag, which would be a plasma membrane, you gotta have a container. In general, membranes are less stable than capsids. And so um, many viruses that, that uh, stay for long periods outside of the body or outside of cells have only a capsid. It allows them to survive longer. But again, if you think about where are these viruses getting their membranes, well, they're getting it from host cells, right? And so it makes it very difficult to recognize viruses as foreign other than their genetic material, right? And we've talked about that in terms of toll-like receptors that recognize viruses are basically recognizing nucleic acids. The rig-like receptors in, in the cytoplasm are basically recognizing aberrant nucleic acids, 
And so the genetic material for the viruses is inside the capsid or inside the viral membrane. And it can be a variety of different forms, any of different form of nucleic acid. It can be double-stranded DNA, it can be single-stranded DNA, it can be double-stranded RNA, single-stranded RNA in a negative sense, meaning it's, it's uh, not coding, or positive sense, single-stranded RNA, meaning it can be directly translated into protein. All of those happen, can also be RNA that's converted into DNA, as in the retroviruses. Please don't spend a lot of time trying to remember which viruses are belong to which family. This isn't virology, so I'm not gonna ask you that. I just want you to know that viruses can have lots of different genetic materials. And what that means is that that's why you have all of those different sensors for double-stranded DNA, you have single-stranded RNA, double-stranded RNA sensors. You have all of those because you're trying to detect these, these non-normal nucleic acids. Now, one bottleneck, though, is that all viruses have to use the host translation machinery. So we have to use host ribosomes to take mRNA to proteins. And so this is one spot where you can start shutting off translation um, to, to be effective against virtually any virus, okay? Because that's the bottleneck. And we'll come back to that in a second. Okay, so all lead to mRNA, all, whatever the genetic material is that a virus starts with, it eventually generates mRNA. And then the proteins are generated by translation using the host cell machinery. And so viruses can't do this on their own. And this is why very little happens outside of a cell. There's some examples of a virus maturation once it gets out of the side of the cell. But most viruses, once they're outside of a cell, are just waiting to infect the next one. They don't do much on their own. OK, so here's a typical virus life cycle. And this is uh, influenza virus. It's an orthopox virus. There's eight gene segments here. That's what that pan flute looking thing is. It's just got different eight gene segments. And it's got some proteins on the surface, the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase proteins that allow it to attach to the cell. And as it, after it attaches, it's taken up in endosomes, where is then the low pH causes fusion of the viral membrane with the host membrane. And that's really the entry step. In doing so, it dumps its genetic material into the cytoplasm. Now, for many viruses, once they do this, they'll replicate the genetic material directly in the cytoplasm. Flu is a little different. It actually goes to the nucleus to replicate. It makes it uh, replicates its genetic material there and then uh, exports the mRNA. But essentially, what you have is sort of the same steps in all virus life cycles. You have attachment has to get into the cell. It then replicates. It makes mRNA so you can get expression of proteins. And those proteins then allow you to assemble new virus that is released from that cell. So when you think about this, you're sort of, I think a lot of people think, oh, well, there's, this, is, uh, this is influenza. Doesn't really look like it's gonna make you sick, right? It's just interested in replicating itself. But what it's actually doing is engaging the immune system at all of these different steps, and that's what really results in disease. So during entry, right, this process of fusion is not terribly efficient, and so some of the viruses actually are getting destroyed in the endosomes, and so that genetic material is released, and you can recognize that with TLR3, 7, 8, 9, and those, so that allows you to recognize genetic material at that entry step. Once it gets into the cytoplasm, in either the genetic material that is replicated for making new, new virus or expression of viral RNA will result in triggering of, of rig-like receptors and nod-like receptors. So there's lots of places that your innate immune system is being engaged during infection. So when we're thinking of virus um, infections, I wanna break it down into three different levels, sort of within a population of hosts, which is the field of epidemiology. How is a virus spread from one person to the next? And then within a host, we'll spend the most time on, which is the immunology part of it, which is 
virus gets into one host, but it still has to get out of that host uh, and is shed to another person. So it's really the biology within a host, and that's mostly the realm of immunology. How is the virus engaging the immune system and, and escaping it? And then finally, we will talk a little bit about the, what a virus has to get into a cell and get back out of a cell. And so we'll talk a little bit of how it does this and in terms of how it's evading the immune system. So the first question is, how is virus transmitted between people? And so if you think about um, a simplest model, for example, uh, if we have smallpox, right? Smallpox only infects humans. And so there's not a rodent reservoir. It's just basically human to human transmission. Uh, it's also for measles, right? Measles is just infecting humans. And so you have one human who's infected here, shedding the virus that then goes on to infect another human to generate another infected host. So for a virus to survive, it has to be able to be transmitted between hosts. This doesn't always mean direct contact. Ebola to be transmitted from human to human requires direct contact with infected blood. If you don't touch the blood, you're not gonna get infected. But that's not always true, right? So you're not gonna get HIV from, um, from uh, coughing or, you know, from, you have to have direct intercourse. But other things like rotaviruses or measles or SARS-CoV-2, can be spread by indirect contact, so environmental contamination. Some of these can be quite long. So some examples are uh, COVID-19 can survive on some surfaces for days. Adenoviruses are very good at this. They can survive on surfaces for many days to weeks. And so somebody comes along and wash their hands, they touch a handrail and leave virus there. You come along, you touch the same rail and rub your nose, now you're infected. But that's still host-to-host -host contact, even though it's indirect. What you'll often see, though, is that the idea is that, that many viruses will have a host. And they typically don't cause a lot of disease in that host. So for one example is bats seem to be a host for many viruses. And the question is, why are they such a good host? Well, it looks like they have Bats have deficiencies in the uh, type one interferon sensing and production pathways. So they don't get terribly sick with stuff. Even though they carry the infection, they don't really get sick. And so, so in this case, I have a, a mouse here shedding the virus and then the virus is spread back into the same population and may, not, may or may not have much disease. The problem happens though, when some host is going to, uh, is to going to spread it zoonotically to a, another species. Now, in general, if a, a virus has adapted to have a mouse as a host, when it transmits to another species, it's going to have a very different, a very different physiology, and it's going to typically cause disease because it's not adapted to that host. Okay, and so viruses typically balancing efficient replication with impeding interaction between hosts. And the, and the whole part of what I'm trying to get at here is that disease actually impedes interactions. If somebody's sick, they typically interact with people less. And so the more sick a virus makes you, the less good it's going to be, or uh, the less chance it has a transmission. The exception to that is if the disease that it's causing is aiding or facilitating transmission. So when a virus has adapted to this host, let's say it's adapted to live in bats or mice, it's really trying to balance that in, in mice. It's trying to not cause disease and in the meantime, replicate efficiently. If it goes, jumps to humans, well, that's not the host it's worried about. And so it doesn't care if it causes disease or not. It's just gonna replicate and do what it can. Okay, and then classic example of this is the Sonoma hantavirus, which, was, uh, which is here in Arizona. It was first discovered in the Four Corners area of uh, Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico. And 
it was causing mostly disease in healthy uh, early 20 somethings who, who were getting infected. And so that virus has adapted to living in deer mice or pinion mice, which are endemic to this area. And so they come into contact with, uh, with those mice or their, or their feces and they get in, inhaled the virus and humans become infected. When the humans get the infection, they have acute respiratory distress and it was very lethal. It's something like 30% lethal. So what limits which species viruses can get into? Well, the first limit is just the presence of cellular receptors, okay? So for example, HIV in order to get into human cells requires human CD4 and human CCR5. And it actually, it, I'm sure many of you know that can also use this human CXCR4, but that's not the one it uses to get into the, a person initially. It involves that over time. And so <clears throat> um, Dan Littman and others have made mice transgenic for human CD4. They knock out the mouse version and replace it with the human version. So they're so-called humanized mice. And those mice can have limited infection with HIV. So it's not a great model, but it, it does provide some infection. So the first level is can a virus get into a cell? It has to have the right receptors. It's, you can think of it as a key in a lock. It doesn't have the right lock there, doesn't matter, then, then your key won't work, you can't get in. But once you get into the cell, there can be additional restriction factors, okay? And, and oftentimes it's the absence of something. So um, apobec proteins are taking, um, are making Cs to use, they're deaminating Cs to use in a cytoplasm. And during viral, when they're activated by virus replication. They're, then in the cytoplasm, they're essentially doing what, uh, uh, what our other proteins do during somatic hypermutation is they're just making mutations in whatever uh, genetic materials in the cytoplasm. And what that essentially does is it mutates the viruses and it blocks their ability to um, encode genes. And in particularly for retroviruses, it blocks the reverse transcription. Okay, so what's the point of this is that uh, SIV, simian immunodeficiency virus, is, encodes a protein called VIF that can block macaque uh, apobec 3G, but not human. And so SIV can re replicate in macaque cells, but if you put it into human cells, it can't do that. It can't, um, you know, can't block the apobec G3 or 3G. And so it, it gets killed in human cells. On the other hand, HIV also includes a, a VIF protein and that can block the human apobec 3G. And so it replicates in human cells, but it can't block the macaque version. And so it can't replicate in macaque cells. This has been shown if you substitute the uh, HIV uh, version into SIV, you can actually have a model for HIV infection. Okay, so it's gotta be able to get into cells and then be able to replicate in cells um, and not be blocked by the, the host. Okay, what other things affect transmission? Well, I think we all know the answer to this. So there's something like at every university, there's something like 100,000 new STD infections every, fresh, every year from people living in dorms. And so there's, there's an environmental component here. A good way to think about this is if you don't want to get dengue, move to Minnesota because the, the vector that um, carries dengue, Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, only occur in tropical zones. They do occur here in Arizona and we do have cases of dengue virus. But uh, if you go north, they're, it's too cold and those mosquitoes can't survive and so you won't get tra transmission. One thing that we often forget about is the nutritional component, right? You derive a lot of the, the, the things that regulate your immune system are, are nutritional and vitamin derived. And so if you don't have proper nutrition, you'll actually have, um, it, un, you'll be unable to control many infections. 
But it's also, uh, we can take it in from our nutritional sources, right? We hear every year about contaminated uh, vegetables or fruit, mostly vegetables, and they're really irrigated with, with uh, wastewater and then not cleaned properly. And so wastewater contains uh, viruses that can contaminate your food and then spread to you. Then finally, there are behavioral issues where if you have IV drug use, you're much many orders of magnitude more likely to contract HIV or hepatitis C. So it can be promiscuity, drug use, increased interaction with other hosts. Right now during our, our quarantine lockdown, we're trying to decrease this interaction by social distancing and staying home. And so that is reducing our transmission. So those are all things that, that can, we can behave differently to affect how viruses are spread in the population. Okay, so what do I want you to learn or what do I want you to know about epidemiology? Really the viruses have to get in and out of hosts and in order to spread. And if they're not able to do that, and then they're not gonna survive and we would never detect them. So most viruses that we know about, or the vast majority, have evolved ways to, to get around that. And then we'll talk about, they've basically you've got only three life strategies to deal with that. Okay, so when a virus then, if it's going to get from one host to the next, has to get into a host and back out. And, and that's not, it's not uh, repeating myself, it's basically saying there's from one person to the next, but if a virus gets into you in order to have transmission, it has to be able to exit you. And that can happen in a number of ways. So here's our virus, in this case, an adenovirus. Adenoviruses are typically spread by respiratory epithelium. So there's an infe infection event, okay? Many viruses will replicate in that epithelium and then jump back out of the system the exact same way. So you flu viruses, or sorry, rhinoviruses, which cause colds, they replicate in your upper, upper respiratory tract cells, and then you start coughing and sneezing and expelling them. And that's really the limit of the infection. But other viruses will spread. So for example, SARS coronavirus will come in, it'll infect your upper respiratory tract, and then it can spread to other organs, including the kidneys, uh, neuro neurological tissues, and others. And the reason it does this, or some viruses do this, is because they want to be shed in a different route than the way they came in. So if it's coming in the respiratory epithelia and it's moving to the kidneys, then you're actually secreting this in the urine. Okay, so this is often seen in, in rodent models. Okay, so this brings up an interest, an, a really important point. How do viruses move within the body? If you think about, if they're starting in the epithelium, how did they get to the, the kidney? And this is a key step in virus um, exposure to the immune system. If it moves within the body, it's going to expose itself to the immune system. And so that's, a, that's where you start to get a response to it. And some of it can be quite complex, right? So for cytomegalovirus, this is the, the virus that causes mono. And if you've had mono in your teens or older, you know it's not a fun event, but it's basically spread from saliva into your oropharynx epithelia. Okay, that's the entry, the first step. And there, from there, it's actually spread to B cells. Okay, so this is one of those viruses that will infect immune cells. And from B cells, it'll spread to your salivary glands, where then you secrete it and infect the next person. Okay, so virus infection with a host can be quite complicated, but in general, it's, it's the more time you spend in a host, the more chance you have of being recognized by the immune system. And that's because viruses move throughout the host the same way that you, you've already learned how they get to a lymph node, right? If we have infection of an epithelial area, that epithelial area has capillaries, uh, venous and arterial capillaries, but it also has the lymphatic capillaries, which are the drain. And so all a virus has to do 
is jump into that lymphatic capillaries and travel through the afferent lymphatics to a lymph node and eventually to the thoracic duct. And if it's developed, dumped there into the blood, now it has access to virtually every site in the body. Okay. Many people think, oh, if I got an infection in my epithelia, it's going directly into the blood. That's not true. It's going into the lymphatics and then eventually into the blood. Now, the upside for this is that's exactly how your immune system wants it to move so that it can recognize it. So the virus is spreading and in order to do so, it has to go into the lymphatics and because of that, it is being recognized by the immune system. So we're talking about a primary site of infection. You've seen this, this graphic before, sort of our stylistic view of the, of the lymphatics. Here's our primary site of infection. The virus is going to go through the lymphatic capillaries to the draining lymph node, and then eventually to the upstream lymph node, and then to the thoracic duct or the right lymphatic duct and be dumped into the blood. And so you have this sort of same setup, the same pattern of that we've talked about viruses getting to a lymph node to initiate an immune response. What we kind of didn't say was, well, that's how they're using your lymphatics to spread throughout the body. Okay, so then if the virus is being spread throughout the body and it's being recognized by the immune system, there's basically only three life strategies that a virus can have. And the first is you get in and out fast. And this is typical of viruses that infect the upper respiratory tract replicate and come out of the upper respiratory tract. It infects the host and replicates fast, but it exits that host before the adaptive immune response can do anything. You'll still generate an adaptive immune response, but it's not, but the virus by that time is gone. The second strategy, apparently I have two ones here, should be two is that the virus will come in, infect the host and replicate fast and use the immune system's own tolerance mechanisms to shut down the adaptive immune response. Now this is a double-edged sword. If you're going to take this strategy, you cause the most damage to the host. And so these are typically hemorrhagic fever viruses like Ebola, Hantan, um, things that are going to make you very sick because you, you're, basically making an all-in bet against the immune system. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. The third strategy is viruses that come into the host and infect the host and, and either create an immune privilege site or, or they um, suppress the immune system recognition of infected cells or they're just hiding out, okay? So it's an immune evasion strategy. And this usually results in some form of latency or hiding out and then periodic reactivation in order for that virus to go to the next host. So let's talk about these each, each of these strategies separately. The first one that sort of is easiest to understand is the entry, fast replication and exit. Okay, the fast in and out strategy. And the, the way that this works is it's very common and it doesn't require a lot of genes. So viruses that just have a few genes can come in, replicate and get out before there's really anything, before the immune system really knows anything to, is there. Okay, and this is common uh, rotaviruses, for example, Norwalk-like agents that you get infected uh, in, in 12 hours, then you're hovering around the porcelain uh, commode and because you're shedding it within 12 to 24 hours. And so it can be really rapid. Now this idea is that, the idea is that you're spreading the virus within a population rather than one individual. So these are highly infectious viruses that get in and re replicate and can leave very fast. And the host will, you know, if you got infected, you will make a protective immune response, but it's too late because the virus is already gone. Okay, so this is very typical for small viruses that just have a few genes. And most of the disease that you're seeing, therefore, is immunopathology or 
disease from the immune system, making an innate response in particular that's very violent and causes you to shed your intestinal epithelia or, or uh, to start vomiting. And this, that then helps the virus to spread. It's, it's one of those cases where disease is actually helping the virus rather than hurting it. So what do we mean by these? Well, it turns out that most of these are, are sort of uh, very common. So things like influenza, rhinoviruses, there's some bronchioviruses, uh, some of the viruses that cause acute respiratory disease. And then as you start getting into longer time frames, you can talk about things that are getting actually much more severe disease. And that's because the longer it's there, the more chance that the immune system is going to make a response to it and cause, uh, cause disease. Now, one of the correlations here, though, is that the smaller a virus is, typically these are all some very small viruses, that they also have higher mutation rates. Okay, so the small viruses up here have high mutation rates compared to, you know, this is the mutation rate in humans. It's about one mutation for every 10 to the 11th, 10 to the 10th um, base pairs. Some RNA viruses can make a mistake every 10,000 base pairs. Okay, so it's essentially every generation giving you another different virus. Okay, so what do I expect you to know from these? It's really to just understand this fast in and out strategy is requiring you to get in and out before the adaptive immune response really has a chance to kick in. If you don't get out by that time, then the adaptive immune response is going to cause more disease. But in any case, you still always get this. Doctor, so here's, yes. So if a patient gets with SCID, um, gets one of these influenzas or common colds, it sounds like most of the disease happens because of your immune response. What happens if someone with SCID gets infected with one of these? Um, the short answer is that, that uh, their innate system gets over-engaged and it still is very pathological. Okay. SCID is typically just B and T, sometimes B, T, and NK deficiency. Uh, but in, if you can think about it, if, you're, if the virus is getting in and replicating to massive levels, your innate system can be quite potent in detecting that and producing inflammatory cytokines. Okay, so here are some examples of sort of the fast replication and exit. And often what you'll see is that for things like measles or even Ebola, you get infection at the epithelial surface and you get transmission from the epithelial surface. So it's, it's a fast in and out, but it's at the skin level. Or hantaviruses, they're gonna cause uh, replication in your upper, upper respiratory tract as well as dengue will do very similar things. Excuse me. And you're getting coughing and spread. And so this is the still that fast replication and exit. Once it's gone, it's gone and there's nothing else to, to worry about. Okay, so the, the, the fast replication and exit is not just limited to you know a few days, it can be weeks, but it's still being transmitted as the immune system is controlling it. Okay, so that's the first strategy. You just get in and get out and you don't really care what the immune system does. If you're gonna stay longer than a few, a few weeks, and it makes it sound like you're a virus on a, on a travel guide, then you have to have other strategies for dealing with the immune system. Because the goal of the immune system is to provide an overwhelming response that controls the infection. If you're gonna stay more than two weeks, which is the peak of the T cell response, you gotta have a strategy to, to deal with that. And the first one is very simple. You overwhelm the immune system, okay? The immune system in particular, we've talked about T cell responses are designed to shut down. A T cell response can't keep going up past the peak because if it did, it's gonna kill you. And so you have it's if we want to anthropomorphize the immune system for a minute, it's basically saying, okay, we did our best. We didn't control the infection. 
So let's shut down so that we don't kill the host. He may be, he may, may still be infected, but at least he's not dead. Okay. Now the downside of this is, you can imagine your immune system is at the point of killing you. And so disease in this strategy is the most severe, right? Where you're basically saying uh, this is that there's a, such an infection here that we have to shut down, otherwise we're gonna kill the host. And sometimes it's not able to shut down and, and it, it, that's when you get lethal disease. Okay, so this is, this can increase the spread in a population because now you have people that are infected for a long period of time. They make an immune response, but it, it gets shut down. And a lot of this is due to inhibitory receptors that basically are telling your cells, okay, got to limit immunopathology. These are all induced by inflammatory cytokines. So your T cells will make interferon gamma and TNF. TNF will induce expression of inhibitory receptors like PD-1 that shut the T cells off. So this is very typical of some small RNA viruses. It can be larger viruses too, but basically there, it has to have, have be something that can replicate so fast that it outpaces the immune system. Okay, and so things like LCMV that have just a couple of genes can do this. And what's happening to your cells is your adaptive immune system, excuse me, just What's happening is if you have acute infection, sort of a fast in and out strategy, then you get all of the things that we've talked about. You take a naive cell, it gets stimulated by dendritic cells to become an effector cell. And then you get memory T cells. And those memory T cells can proliferate again if they get exposed to antigen. They can make cytokines. They can do all the things that we talked about. But instead, if you have a chronic infection or a persistent infection, then that effector's T cell keeps getting stimulated or your, your cells that came from your naive cells keep getting stimulated. And the first thing that happens is they start to lose their proliferative potential. And that is accompanied by the loss of IL-2, the T cell growth factor. Okay, so the more you stimulate them, the worse off they are. They also start, so that's the first step is to shut them off their proliferation. The second step is shut off their cytokines. Cytokines are more dangerous, particularly TNF is the most dangerous molecule in your body. So you want them to stop doing that. So they're gonna stop proliferating and then they are gonna stop making cytokines that can kill you. Might surprise you that the third thing they shut off is killing, which doesn't, make a lot of, uh, initially shouldn't make a lot of sense. Like why, that seems like that's the, the biggest function, but actually the cytokines are much more dangerous than direct cell killing. And eventually if you keep stimulating them, these cells will die off and you won't have any cells there at all. It's really controlled by a lot of these inhibitory receptors that are getting a lot of press as immune checkpoint blockade or in, immune checkpoint blockade therapies. Okay, so that's the chronic persistent virus infection. Well, is there anything you can do about it? Yeah, I mean, this is a drug, uh, nivolumumab, which is, is a anti-PD-L1 or PD-1, it's an anti-PD-1 antibody. It's called Opdivo. It's used in cancer patients but it's an antibody that blocks this interaction. It blocks the interaction of PD-1 with PD-L1 or PD-1 ligand, I guess is the proper way to say it. And the, the whole way that this is working is the inhibitory receptors that are being upregulated as you get farther and farther down this, this uh, chronic stimulation have phosphatases associated with their cytoplasmic tails. And so, if we remember the immunologic synapse, you're trying to group together kinases to get T cell activation and exclude phosphatases. But if you start expressing PD-1 that has phosphatases associated with its cytoplasmic tail, those are gonna shut off TCR signaling. And so 
The idea is if you use antibodies to block this and push it away, you want to push this away from the TCR, then you can get uh, proximal kinase signaling and, and T cell activation. So that does, does work. And uh, mice that are deficient in PD-1 don't shut off their T cell response and they die during viral, viral infection typically. So this is a very dangerous pathway. In, in, in human cancer patients get treated with anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1. Um, they can have severe uh, immunopathology and it can be life-threatening. So it's, it's not something I would do lightly. Okay, so that's our second strategy. The virus gets in and just replicates as fast as it can to overwhelm the immune system. And their version, the life cycle one and two are sort of, uh, are very similar. One is get in and get out. One is get in and just overwhelm the immune system and while you're taking your time getting out. The third strategy is, this is sort of episodic reactivation or well, often called latency or immune privileged infection. But it's really just, you have a strategy that you get in, you replicate, and then you evade the immune system. And we'll spend most of the rest of the time talking about this. And it can be because you're infecting an immune privileged site, such as the testes or uh, some of the reproductive organs or neurological tissue. Uh, but you can also create immune privilege sites by expressing things that block the immune system or suppress immune recognition. And then eventually what happens is that you've replicated and then you've sort of gone quiet and you have this evasion period, but then there's a reactivation event and that allows you to spread the virus to the next host. Now, what should be obvious from this is that usually in order to do this, you have to have a fairly big genome. You have to encode a number of proteins that allow you to regulate turning off your genes, going latent, turning back on your genes, uh, evading the immune system. So we'll talk about some of the strategies. But essentially here, um, you get some episodic reactivation, but the immune system is really ignorant that the virus is even there, it doesn't know. Okay, and this is very typical of large DNA viruses like the herpes viruses, some of the adenoviruses um, that have all the opportunity to express a lot of these different genes. So one of the, the ways that this works, right, is that you're probably all familiar with is varicella zoster virus. Uh, this is chickenpox. And so it gets in through the epithelial cells and then it'll hide out in your uh, dorsal root ganglion. So here it comes in through the skin, goes to the dorsal root ganglion and it just hides out there. And it typically is not reactivating very much, but when it does reactivate, it will come back out of that neuron and either go to other sites like the, the gut mucosa and be spread, or it will go back to the original site and that's where you get shingles, okay? Now, in order to do this, it has to have a multi, this is a multi-step lifestyle. So you require many different receptors to get into many different types of cells. And so herpes viruses have many different glycoproteins, you know, it's glycoprotein A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Uh, there's even more than that, but, but you have lots of receptors to get in lots of different kinds of cells. And then you have uh, different uh, genes that regulate whether it's gonna be latent or lytic or reactivated. And then where does it go once it gets reactivated? So these kinds of infections are really limited to large viruses with many genes. Okay, now we'll come back to that idea in just a second. But we think about our host immune response to a pathogen. We've typically call, uh, phrased this in terms of the pathogen gets in, replicates, and is controlled. And that really is that first lifestyle of in and out and uh, spread before, before you get killed in that host. Okay, but in reality, this could go you know, this pathogen could go like this. And it wouldn't really change much of the, uh, how the immune response is getting started. Wouldn't change a lot of how the immune response is, uh, the eventual fate of it, but it changes the function of it and, and sort of modulates it. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, so the first wave that we've talked about before 
is this idea of during a viral infection is the type one interferon response. And the reason that we know this is so important is that there are many viruses uh, devote more than half their genome just to interfere with this pathway. So remember, what is the point of it? The point of type one interferons are to, if there's an infection, is to tell the cells surrounding that infected cell, hey, I'm infected, you get ready. If you get infected, you are gonna be ready to shut down. Okay, so the virus comes in to a cell here. Here's our cell. And it uncoats, here's the virus genome, starts replicating. And that's going to be detected by one of the rig-like receptors, okay? The intracellular uh, receptors that can recognize nucleic acids. That then signals through the ERF3, and ERF7 transcription factors to give you type one interferons. Those are then secreted and they bind to the type one interferon receptor on neighboring cells. That signals through STAT1 and 2 to upregulate the 2,5-OAC, oligoadenylate cyclase, and protein kinase R, okay? That doesn't shut down that neighbor cell, it just gets it ready to shut down. And then what happens is if this cell were to get infected, the double strand is, so let's say this virus is then spread to this cell, then what happens is that double-stranded RNA is going to activate PKR and activate 2,5-OAC, and those then activate second thing. So PKR will phosphorylate EIF2-alpha, and that shuts down translation. It will also, 2,5-oligodinylase uh, synclase will activate RNAs L, and that will then, the RNAs L will, will start degrading the mRNA. And so you also are shutting down that translation. Remember, all viruses have to use the host translation machinery. If you're degrading mRNA and shutting down the, the uh, ribosomal components, there's no translation, and so they can't make more virus. Okay, so this is a really important pathway in, in inhibiting virus responses. The other key cytokines that are made during a, a viral infection are TNF, IL-12, and interferon gamma. These are all Th1 cytokines. Now, the main job of IL-12, of course, is to initiate a Th1 program, right? It's, it, that's what it's doing. And so then interferon gamma production by T cells is going to continue that Th1 program. But if you think about IL-12, it's really activating your innate cells for direct killing and then programming a Th1 helper response. Interfering gamma will activate T cells, will interfere with virus and uh, replication, but it also causes you to have systemic antibodies. So you're getting isotype switching to IgG. Excuse me, very congested this morning. Um, and then TNF, again, is the most dangerous cytokine that you make in your body, primarily because it's causing vascular leakage. It's, it's loosening up your endothelial cell junctions so that cells, once you generate a CTL response, the cells can go from the blood and get into tissues and start killing infected cells. Now, for all of these, you have this sort of uh, feedback regulation. If you make too much TNF, or if you start making TNF, TNF will upregulate the inhibitory proteins like PD-1 that will shut off T cells. And so you can't keep making it forever. And if you're in gamma, we'll do this very much the same thing. And so a lot of times you see this, um, you see this in other systems where there's a feedback negative regulation, but in the immune system, it gets a little more complicated. So we take our example of IL-6, IL-6 is initially made as an inflammatory cytokine, and that acts on your hypothalamus to increase your body temperature, and that's an antiviral response. But if you keep making IL-6, then that eventually uh, you, you'll start acting on other hormone pathways. You don't have to memorize these, I'm just giving you an example. Eventually, your adrenal glands will start making corticosteroids. And these will shut down the T cell response. You can think of this as a antiviral response. Okay, so IL-6 early is great. 
eventually IL-6 later becomes bad. Type 1 interferons initially will be antiviral. If you have continued to make them, then they eventually become proviral or immune tolerizing. Okay, so let's just review our adaptive immune response to viral infection. The virus is gonna come once you get an infection for the virus to move through the body, it has to infect or has to be transported through the afferent lymphatics. And that can be a dendritic cell that's captured the virus. It can be virus that is being transported by macrophages, or it can be free virus that's getting in there um, into the lymphatics by the follicular reticular network and being picked up by dendritic cells in the lymph node. This isn't any different than the, the immune response that we've talked about so far. If it's uh, coated with IC3B, it is then transferred to follicular dendritic cells for initiation of B cell responses. And the B cells are coming in through the high endothelial venules. They're engaging this on the follicular dendritic cells. So the B cell receptor is seeing the virus and the complement receptor two is seeing IC3B. That results in B cell activation. The B cells get activated, they go towards the T cell zone looking for CD4 help. If they don't get it, they form the primary foci plasma blast and that makes low affinity IgM. Okay, so this is the same response that we've talked about all semester. The T cells will come in and they'll recognize uh, virus peptides that are being presented on dendritic cells. And those are either dendritic cells that came out or came in from the periphery because they picked up virus or dendritic cells that were already in the lymph node that picked up virus that leaked out of the follicular reticular network. But in either case, you're going to get a T cell response and they, those T cells proliferate and differentiate to become effector cells. As they do that, the conventional cells, effector cells will exit but the follicular helper cells will migrate towards the B cell zones. And this is where you get that initial CD40 signal to a B cell to form the germinal center where you get affinity maturation, isotype or uh, somatic hypermutation and affinity maturation. You get isotype switching and then you get differentiation into memory B cells or antibody secreting plasma cells. Okay, so that's the entire immune response to a virus in, in one slide. Okay, so it's, it's actually pretty, pretty similar to everything we've talked about so far. So what are T cells doing? Okay, well, you sort of have to break down what are the jobs of the immune system? The first one that, that is perhaps the most important is the type one interferon response. For many viruses, if this is not there, then, then you're never gonna be able to control the infection. But really, you're, if you're going to protect against infection, right, type 1 interferons are going to make cells resistant to infection. But the other thing that you want to do is, is block the virus. And that's the job of antibodies. Early during an infection, they don't do a great job of that right? because they're IgM, they're low affinity. They haven't been really made to do this yet. On the other hand, if you get an infection and it becomes established, now you have to start killing infected cells, okay? So this is a, there's the, either you prevent the virus getting, establishing infection, or you got to eradicate once it does. And for innate cells, NK cells can recognize infected cells, right? They do this by recognizing aberrant expression of cell proteins, including MHC. And then you have CD8 T cells or Th1 CD4 cells who are trying to kill infected cells. So this is, if there's an established infection, you gotta get rid of it. And that's really in a nutshell, what we're dealing with here. How do the viruses deal with the B cell response, the interferon response and the T cell response? Now in reality, they don't spend much time trying to interfere with B cell responses, mainly because that's not a big deal to them. You can tell a lot about 
what's important to a virus by which proteins it's expressing to interfere with which pathways. And so there's a number of ways that viruses can escape from the immune system. And I think we're all familiar that, that small viruses <coughs> can replicate. And because they're smaller, <coughs> they have a higher mutation rate. And so for, for example, for influenza virus, virus can infect humans and then it can acquire mutations that essentially this is antigenic drift. They change with mutation rate and that allows them to sort of, if you get enough mutations, you can infect, uh, reinfect another host. It's essentially evading from the antibody response. On the other hand, and this will typically cause, you know, epidemics, which are small localized outbreaks. On the other hand, if you have uh, influenza viruses that are infecting waterfall, fowl, primarily ducks, and, and these viruses can also infect pigs. So you have the human virus going into pigs. So this virus is going here, and this virus is going here, and you get a reassortment where you get at least one of the genes from the fowl virus going into the human version. And now you get this uh, antigenic shift. That then causes a virus that can infect a whole lot of new people because it looks totally new to the immune system. And that is then where you get uh, flu pandemics. Okay, so this is one of the main ways the viruses will evade from B cell recognition. They don't have to do a lot, just vary their surface antigens. On the other hand, if you're going to try and evade the T cell response, you have to have much more elaborate strategies. And so that can be things like what we just talked about is restrict virus gene expression. This is the, if you're going to have an episodic life cycle, you just say, okay, I'm not gonna make any proteins and therefore the immune system can't see me. In reality, even during latent infection, uh, viruses still may have to make some proteins because they have to be able to regulate whether or not they get reactivated, okay? So, but it's very few proteins. And so what some of the viruses do is say, well, okay, I'm actually going to take this time where I'm latent and not really replicating to redirect the immune system. Okay, so cytomegalovirus is notorious for this. Comes in to you from the saliva, your freshman year and uh, you get infected it goes into your oropharyngeal epithelia. Now, you make responses to the immediate early, the early and late proteins. These are all proteins the viruses need for, for replication and assembly and, and release from the cell. Those are the things that the virus really needs. But once it actually hides out in the B cells, sorry, I think I've got these reversed. This should be over here. Um, when it's being, when the virus is hiding out in B cells, it's actually making a decoy protein called phosphoprotein 65. And it makes so much of this protein that the immune system becomes keyed onto that protein and basically directs all of its resources to say, okay, I'm gonna make antibodies to this, gonna make T cell responses to this. And in doing so, you lose all the responses to the things the virus really needs. Okay, so this is, PP65 is a disposable protein. So they, they really are making decoy responses. And that's very common for latent proteins. Okay, now the other thing that viruses are worried about, right, are the type one interferon pathway and uh, evading T cell recognition. Those are the two main things that a virus has to do to either persist or have a, you know, a long-term survival within a host. And so you can, in order to evade type one interference, you can either stop them being made in the first place, which is very common. And so here's, here's the pathway. If you ever get angry at me for, for making you memorize long pathways, you don't have to memorize this one. I'm just showing you that this includes all of the different steps in signaling through TLR3 to eventually make type one interferons. Here's the interferon beta promoter. So you look at each of these sort of green boxes is a virus that will either inhibit NF-kappa B activation, it can inhibit TBK1, uh, 
members of the uh, inhibitor of NF-kappa B kinase complex. They can inhibit TLR3 directly. You can see they can do, they inhibit almost any step that would lead to interferon beta production. So it's basically, if you're, that's important to you as a virus to persist in the host, you've got to block it. The other thing you can do is instead, or in, in addition to block interferons being made, is to block their signaling, okay? All of the, all of the circles here in red, those are viral proteins from a number of different viruses that are inhibiting signaling from interferon, type one interferons through the type interferon uh, receptor. Okay, so they can block binding, they can block uh, signaling through this recruitment of the JAK proteins. They can block phosphorylation of the STAT proteins. They can block downstream events of, of transcription, uh, uh, translocation to, transcription factor translocation to the nucleus. And they can degrade all of those things too. And so you either inhibit type one interferons being made or you block the signaling from them once you, they are made. Now, on the other hand, that's sort of blocking the innate recognition. If you're going to block T cell recognition, then you have to have more uh, elaborate strategies. And so most of the time blocking T cell recognition is blocking episode, uh, epitopes being loaded onto MHC proteins, okay? And so you can either block the proteasome so it can't degrade proteins, this is common for herpes viruses, or if it's going to make those peptides, chew up peptides and, and put them through TAP, you just block the TAP protein. And so you don't load the peptides through into the endoplasmic reticulum so they can't bind to MHC. Even if they get that far, many viruses have strategies. Well, they're just gonna take, bind to the uh, cytoplasmic tail of the MHC proteins and take them somewhere to de degrade them. And so the gist of that is you don't get T cell recognition. Now, you may say, well, okay, but NK cells can recognize if there's no MHC there, the NK cells can recognize it, but NK cells don't proliferate as much. And so you, the virus can, is mainly concerned with the T cell response for element uh, evasion. And the other thing that, that the other things that viruses can do is sort of is mess up the, the um, cytokine environment and start to suppress the immune response during infection. So they can make suppressive cytokines like IL-10. Many viruses make the, have their own version of these cytokines that either block binding of inflammatory responding uh, or that block binding of inflammatory cytokines from the host, or that will actually activate inhibitory pathways in the host. And they can also make sort of decoy receptors. And so these are soluble receptors that will bind to the host cytokines and prevent them from activating effector cells. And if you look in both of these, what you're trying to do is prevent activation of Th1 cytokines so you shut down the response. Okay, so what do I want you to know from this? I really would like you to know the three different uh, types of life strategies for a virus, okay? The quick in and out strategy, the overwhelm the immune system and, and persist strategy, and then the uh, infection and immune evasion or hiding out strategy. You don't need to know specific virus names, just the general strategies and how this allows the virus to complete its life cycle. You don't have to know the specific virus genes that are inhibiting uh, specific parts of the interferon pathway or T cell recognition pathways. Just tell me, be able to understand how might you block that? Block the signaling that leads to interferon production or block the signaling that downstream of the interferon receptor. Then I think some other ideas then are, what is disease? Where is it coming from, right? It's mostly the immune system during a virus infection. So if we modulate that, we actually can improve disease outcome. Okay, um, so just know the different lifestyles, the general strategies, and then 
which pathways are mainly targeted for immune evasion? Okay, so we're gonna finish up with bonus question 13, which is, which is for you to justify. We're sort of getting into a little bit more um, uh, narrative questions. The question is, would you expect a virus that infects Palo Verde trees to have a large genome or a small genome? And I want you to justify your answer based on the immune invasion strategies discussed in class. How many different things would it have to block? And would that, uh, if it's going to infect Palo Verde trees, does it have to persist? Or can it get the quick in and out version? Okay, and with that, I'll stop and take questions. For the bonus question, Dr. Blackman, do you want us to do research on that? Um, tree and the viruses or just base it off of what we've learned so far without doing outside research? It's a logic question. So I, I don't want you to go and do research on Palo Verde viruses and what, what they are and what they do. I'm okay. just asking you, what would you expect and why? Okay, thank you. Okay, there's no questions. I'll see you on Tuesday.